You're listening to The Jam Price Show, all about movies. And today, my guests are Thomas Hamilton, who is the director of a brand new documentary that we're going to be discussing, and the co-writer and co-producer, Ron McCoskey. Uh, and the film we're going to be talking about today, and, and it, it really is fascinating, is Bar Boris Karloff, The Man Behind the Monster. And I must tell you, this was very, very interesting. I mean, I... I have, I have to say, I've never been, I'm not a fan of horror pictures. So I really haven't watched many of them. Of course, we've all seen Frankenstein and many of the other ones that Boris Karloff starred in. But this isn't a genre that I normally go to. So it was fascinating to find out more about him, the man behind the mask. And uh, so thank you both for coming. And again, fascinating. I want to know how you both were attracted to this project. Um, Ron, why don't you start since you were the <laughs> co-writer on this? Thank you. Well, you know, if it wasn't for Mary Shelley, who wrote the original novel, she was 18 years old at the time. Amazing. It's never been out of print. An amazing story. So it started with her. So by her writing the book, it then became a play. And uh, even the silent film, Thomas Edison did its silent version. And then with the success of Dracula, it then Frankenstein followed. And I was a little kid growing up in the 60s. These films were shown on TV. I fell in love. I right, right away uh, related to the monster, which I'm told millions of other children did as well. Yes. As a, you know, an outsider, a person that wasn't understood and was shunned. And um, I said, this is great. This is so wonderful. I got my first monster model in 1962. I still have it. <laughs> And I just started collecting. And in 1997, I had a chance to meet Sarah Karloff, Boris Karloff's only child. Wow. And one of the first things I said to her is, Sarah, I want to make a film about your dad. He deserves it. He did so much uh, with his work that he deserves to have a, a spotlight shown on him. And it took me a long time. It was it's very difficult to find the right filmmaker, the right person that could do this. And that all changed two years ago when I met Thomas Hamilton. Mm. And Thomas, how did so? How did you two meet, and what made you decide that you would like to get involved with this film project? Well, okay, um, I was. I mean, I've always been a fan of Boris Karloff. I mean, it wasn't you know, it wasn't a stretch when when Ron first um, introduced himself to me. But um, I had made a film about Leslie Howard um, from Gone with the Wind uh, called Leslie the Howard. Man, Yeah, I called the Man Who Gave a Damn, and uh, it first showed up on Turner Classic Movies on June the 4th, 2018. And Ron was watching that night and he saw the film, he, he liked it, and he found my email. I'm not quite sure how, but he found my email and emailed me the next night and said, I, I really liked your film. Would you be interested in doing a project about Boris Karloff? And there was a real uh, kismet moment because I had been very preoccupied with trying to get hold of a Boris Karloff film over the previous few weeks that, that I really wanted to see. And so Boris Karloff was very much on my mind. And um, it didn't take much. I thought this is a wonderful story. Karloff's career is so massive. And uh, I could immediately see the potential. And uh, I, I said to, to Ron, yes, of course. And even though there wasn't any money in, in, in the frame at that point, I thought if we do a Kickstarter campaign, I'm sure we'll be able to raise enough to at least get going with the filming. And so what happened was Ron and I met a couple of months, but maybe a month or a, six weeks later, I went to Edison and we shot a whole series of campaign videos for Kickstarter, which are now you watch them. They're quite funny because we're like a double act. <laughs> and we're sort of trading quips about Boris Karloff. And, um, and the campaign started that September. Funny enough, when I was in Toronto, and uh, it did very well. And uh, we were able then the following month to go to LA and start shooting all these interviews. And it was just a kind of roller coaster from there. But um, I was very happy to be involved because it was just such a great story. And, and also I was interested in the fact that I could explore the, the life of this guy, his acting and, and the way, you know, he always brought something more to the table than you would expect in those films. So it was he, a real joy. I, I, you know, it, it, it's fascinating for me. There were a number of, well, so many things in this movie, mm. but um, he never gave up. 
you know, he, no. he, 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 you know, he had a lot of setbacks. It wasn't that he was an instant star and it, by any means. And he started no. in silent films and on the stage and he traveled, you know, he was from England originally, as you know, and then traveled, you know, to uh, Canada. And I just love the fact that he persevered. He never, mm. ever, and that, I mean, even though he sometimes would leave to go make money doing other jobs, yes. which was what you have to do when you're an actor, because, uh, you know, you don't make money right away doing it, if ever, <laughs> and uh, that he, he didn't, he persevered with that. So it was, to me, that's that little engine that could, you know, I love those yes. stories about people who don't give up on their dream, and he mm -hmm. had this dream. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about um, how, about his big break and how he, because he was a background actor in many films and mm -hmm. uh, how he actually broke into, uh, into, into you know, starting to become more mainstream. Well, Allison, I'm sorry. That's right. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I believe with you a thousand percent. Uh, when I first sat down and thought of telling the story, one of the titles I thought of was called Opening Doors. And, and here's what I meant by it. When he was on the other side of that door, waiting to walk in for that first time, he was a struggling actor, just trying to make his bills, trying to feed his family. When he came through that door and well did that close up, he became a star and his life changed and everything changed after that. But you're absolutely right. He just never gave up. He was 44. By all rights, he should have quit. He should have gone on to something else and say, look, I'm not gonna make it, but he didn't. And in many ways, that's how I felt about this film. I said, I can't stop. I've got to get this story told. I have to make this film. And it changed when I met Thomas. So Tom, tell, tell Jane about the background of, of Karloff. Um, uh, well, uh, as, I, as I said before, when, um, when Ron contacted me, it was really, it was clear to me that we could, we could raise funds through Kickstarter and we could get attention as well. And having previously made a film which everyone told me was basically impossible to do, which was the Leslie Howard one, I thought, well, I know I can make this film and I know that we can do it and we just have to keep going. And it's very much the Karloff approach. Um, and Karloff's big break, of course, as you know, was Frankenstein. But one of the things that I wanted to try and avoid in this film was the, the usual sort of it starts when he's born and, and, and it follows him through and eventually becomes successful because I'm thinking this is a 21st century audience. If we don't get them right into the center of the story at the beginning, we're going to lose their attention. And so I thought it was important to start as he becomes successful. And then into the film, 30 minutes in, that's when you go back and you start revealing what made the man what he is. And then that sets everything up for the rest of the film because you start seeing how conscientious he was and he does the Screen Actors Guild. And you understand, I hope, where that's coming from because you've, you've seen the background by that point. But um, I felt it was very important to kind of really bring the audience in and give them some of the most exciting images at the beginning so we could really have their attention. Oh, and so I love, yeah, go ahead. He believed a great deal in luck too. He felt that he was a very lucky man he used to phrase being on the right corner at the right time. And there's a story about how he got uh, in the criminal code. He went down to see his agent. His agent wasn't there. So he was going to go to one of the uh, clubs that he belonged to. And he says, now I owe dues. I can't go there. He's going to go get a coffee and a newspaper. He says, no, I don't have money for that. <laughs> so then he said, well, let me stop by the actor's equity uh, building. That's where my post office box is. Let me see if there's any mail. And while he's there, the woman says, are you working? And he says, no, not at the moment. He says, they're casting for a play called The Criminal Code. Do you want to try out? He went right down there, got it. And that film was really important because it eventually led to uh, Frankenstein because he was in the play. And then when they made it into a film, Howard Hawks wanted him in the film. And, and then things started going after that. Again, just amazing. And I love the way, Thomas, that you did film it, that you did pull us in right away and, and then, you know, unfolded the story, you know, along, you know, for all of us. And, and I, yeah, it was amazing how he, is, he was one of the founding uh, members of the Screen mm. Actors Guild. He was very yes. instrumental in getting, you want to talk a little bit about that, Thomas, about how he got, you know, how that all came about for many people, because 
I am a member of SAG and AFTRA mm -hmm. and Actors Equity, actually. I studied acting in New York a million years ago. But um, but so I'm really happy that they did start that. So you want to talk a little bit about why yes, they began that? Certainly. And, and I'd also like to say a little thank you to um, SAG AFTRA themselves, who were very helpful in this film. They let us film in, in the boardroom at the SAG AFTRA um, uh, office block um, twice. Once for uh, to, to film Valerie Yaros, who's the, the archivist there, and the second time when we filmed Peter Bogdanovich, because Peter couldn't be filmed at his home at that time because it was undergoing renovation, and they very kindly said, well, bring him in here. So, so that was incredibly kind of them, and it was because of Boris's association. Um, Boris basically had a very tough time in films in the silent age, and, you know, like every actor that was a somewhat obscure he was treated like cattle and uh, you know worked long hours much longer than he was being paid for even when he was doing frankenstein um, he was only paid when he walked on the set in full makeup and yet he would be in the chair four hours earlier having jack pierce's makeup done and then another two hours having the makeup taken off so you know he was and he only got paid um, five hundred dollars for the entire film. So it really wasn't, was it, am I, am I right, Ron? 500 for the entire film? It wasn't a lot of money and they really didn't look to him as being one of the stars or one of the people to draw into the film. But no, yeah, Thomas yeah. was right. He was paid very little and wasn't treated very, very nice. Yeah. And, so, and so basically when he was, um, he had become a star and he was in England, he was coming back from England and um, I believe it was James Gleason uh, the character actor James Gleason approached him and asked him if he would be interested in this new union of actors that was being formed. And it had been happening whilst he was away. And uh, he said, of course. And they, they, they started going to meetings in secret because it could ruin your career, especially for a new star who, you know, the studio could just say, well, maybe we won't bother with this one anymore and we'll just quietly let him go in a few B pictures. So it was a dangerous thing to do. And, um, but he was very passionate about it. He would go on to other people's sets as well. There's a wonderful story um, about him going on to the Petrified Forest set uh, when he was at Warner's doing a film called The Walking Dead. And uh, so he's in his ghoul makeup and he walks onto the set and says, no, would you be interested in joining the Screen Actors Union? And of course they took him seriously. And um, yeah, no, he was, he would, find out which members of the cast weren't in his own films weren't union members and he would talk to them and very sort of sweetly suggest that they consider joining and that was one of the things about Boris was he was so um, understated in the way he did things he was passionate but he didn't overplay his card you get that, you know, you, you definitely get that feeling about him that uh, he wasn't bravado or any of that. He was, you know, very, yeah, he was very, very low key. Um, and certainly his on screen presence even belies that too, in the way that he played um, the monsters that he played, you know, he, Frankenstein. I mean, let's talk about, let's talk about that because that little, the scene with the little girl with the flower, uh, you, you both can take this i'll start with you ron um because that was really fascinating that whole story about that and how yeah, that just, changed the film go ahead yeah it shows again what uh, what type of person he was uh, marilyn harris played the little girl and when they first went out they it was a location shoot so it wasn't done on the studio they had to drive to, to get to the lake and uh boris was in full makeup full costume and he wasn't too sure how she was going to react but she went right up to him, grabbed his hand and said, can we ride together? Uh, so right away, they formed a bond, a relationship. And then when they got up there and the scene was about to take place, he disagreed with the director, James Well, on how it should be played. And, you know, eventually it got cut out. And, and there wasn't much to know about that. But in our film, we get a chance to really delve into what happened and, and tell about... Um, how it, it changed the way that Karloff, Karloff in his mind had a certain way to play the creature of, in fact, one of our wonderful interviewers, uh, Greg Mank, said that Well wanted to be, uh, Well wanted the monster to be able to frighten people 
but also to be frightened. And that's what Karloff showed after that scene, that he did, the monster did not realize what he had done. Um, Tom, what, what else do you have to say about that? I, I was going to say that um, from, from a directoral point of view, it was very interesting to me because what I wanted to do, what I like to do in these kind of documentaries, I don't just want to sort of, you know, put a little bit of narration on and, and say this happened and this happened. I want the audience to experience it in real time almost and and to see the the process because i think it's really fascinating and it and it brings this film history to life it stops being something that was 90 years ago and it becomes something you understand and you feel right now and so that's one of my favorite scenes in the film for that very reason because i was able to build it up and you know we have the music of laura forest hay which really is quite something under that scene Mm -hmm. um and it's it's one of my favorite moments I, I just as storytelling well and you got access to i mean it's amazing all of mm. the things that you got access to and you got access to because there was two different cuts of that or, or more than two mm. yes a yes. couple different cuts to that film so how did you how were you able to uh to get the original and then the edited version well, of it. Well, the thing is, the edited version was around for a very long time, and it was shown on TV in England and America right up to the end of the 80s. And it was a, towards the end of the 80s that they restored that scene back, and also other scenes with Colin Clive where he says, now I know what it is to be a god, you know, that scene. Um, and so, actually, I went to a friend who I knew had been taping stuff for 40 years and I said do you have an old copy of Frankenstein so he he sent me the the, the tape and I and I just recreated the cut in in the current version because it would have been very fuzzy but I recreated the cut so that you could see it and and experience it wow amazing that's amazing right there the <laughs> the wizardy of uh filmmaking yeah. in that aspect you you have a lot of wonderful people in this film mm. um you have uh I, who i love uh guillermo del toro um roger corman everybody's a, everybody is a, uh, connected to roger corman i can't tell you mm. how many interviews this, sh this show has been over, it's launched over five years ago and mm. i've had so many different filmmakers and actors and whose mm. careers got started with roger corman so he's he's like a, he's a he's a through line with everyone but you also i mean peter bogdan Bogdanovich, who I, I love, but Christopher Plummer um, mm. before he died. So let's talk a little bit about how you attracted, I mean, Stephanie Powers, it was great seeing her, H how you attracted uh, these various um, people to come and talk about Boris Karloff and their experiences uh, about him as an actor. And um, yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that, Thomas, and tell me how you got, how you attracted all of these wonderful people. Well, in, in one sense, it was very straightforward. Um, I would find if there was an email contact for these people through IMDb Pro or, or for their agents. And I would write to them and say um, and explain about the project and what we were trying to do. And many times mention of the name Boris Karloff got a fairly instant reaction. Stephanie Powers was the very first person to come on board. And she wrote back to me and she said, I would be thrilled to be part of this film. She was so enthusiastic and, and, and very lovely. Mm -hmm. And um, she was one of the first interviews we, we actually filmed. Um, Christopher Plummer uh, we, was not so easy to get directly in touch with, but we did it through his agent at the Pitt Agency. And, and word came back to us, yes, he wants to. I know that with that one, Ron initially tried and I then tried. And uh, and it was taking a while um, because he was between he was in a number of films at that time. And what eventually happened was um, my wife discovered that Plummer, Christopher Plummer, was going to be in Toronto uh, at a retrospective of his own films, of his career. And so we contacted his agent and said, if we book ourselves into the same hotel where Christopher's staying, <laughs> and we set it all up in our room, do you think he would he would be able to take 15 minutes and you know they, they went to Christopher and Christopher said yes of course and so he strolled into our room at three o'clock sat down did this interview which was beautiful and was absolutely charming couldn't have been nicer and um yeah 
So it, when it happened, it was so simple. It was a great, that's a great story. A uh, guerrilla filmmaking, that's what you were doing. A little bit, yes. yes. <laughs> very polite. Yeah, and I, I also have to add that Christopher Plummer, to me, kind of uh, took the mantle from uh, Karloff as far as the type of acting and the fact that he did television and film. He would love to go back uh, to the stage and, and do plays as well. And just a wonderful man. I mean, he worked with Karloff on television and also uh, on the stage. And we were so lucky to get him. Just yeah. just a wonderful, mm. wonderful presence. Oh, was that probably one of his last uh, appearances before he passed away? I believe um, so, yes. He did he did um he did another series. He did a TV series, I think, called Entourage or something like that. I can't remember exactly the night the title, but um we filmed him in November twenty eighteen. So okay. there was a bit of time. Yeah. Um but I mean he was in he was in great form when we saw him and just lovely man i will tell you a secret Anne. the the what sorry not Anne, jan i will tell you a secret <laughs> i'm getting all kinds of names today <laughs> well this, this is the, this is the fifth interview we've done on in a row but um, the um the one interviewee that i was nervous about was roger corman i started shaking before we went in the room with him because it was just it's roger corman it, it, it huge in my life just huge so that was the one time I, I felt myself sort of quaking, but he was lovely as well. Yeah, yeah. As I said, all, all roads lead to Roger Corman. Truly, <laughs> it just seems truly. like it's amazing. Let's take a little bit, we don't have a lot of time, but a little bit about the um, This Is Your Life segment, because that mm -hmm. was also interesting. Uh, do you want to start with that, Ron? Yeah, you know, in our film, you'll find out he had a lot of secrets. <laughs> he had a lot of things he did not want to divulge. So when you see him look at his wife mm. and say, what's going on? And he's sitting there, you can imagine what's going through his mind to say, who are they going to bring out? You know, what are they going to reveal? And even though he was very good friends with Ralph Edwards, they used to socialize. He still, I think he was just petrified on what was going to happen. And yet mm. the end result was beautiful. I mean, he brought out you know, somebody that they work with in Canada together. They brought out Jack Pierce. They brought out a famous cricket player. Uh, his daughter was there. So it turned out great, but it was tense for a while. It was not a happy moment for Boris. He definitely, you know, that's what it looked like too. And that's what you talk about. Yeah. Go ahead, Thomas. You have no, more to I, add I, to I was, I, No, I was, I was actually just agreeing with Ron. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it was, it was, it was a horrible experience in a way. Apart from the fact that they had Jack Pierce and the cricket player, and you can see that Boris lights up when Jack Pierce walks on. He was so happy to see him. And I think that's a lovely moment because that's he, he says, I owe everything to this man. Hmm. That 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 was a good moment. And you know, he did you know, he helped people and he didn't, and I guess they brought somebody, they brought someone out that, you know, he had helped and he didn't want anybody to know that. He wanted to no, keep those things private. And that says a lot about him and his character also, you know? Yes, yes. And and we, we, we heard a lot of other stories along those lines of, you know, people that he helped in one way or another. And um, the trouble is you can only feature so much in, in a 90 minute film. And we also didn't want it to get too well, Christopher Plummer actually said this. He said, you, you want to be careful. It doesn't get too mushy. And um, we tried to avoid that. I hope we succeeded. He was a very giving actor. Um, there's a term for when one actor is just talking into a camera and giving lines and another actor's off camera. And usually they have someone else read the lines. But Boris used to be one of those actors that said, no. I'll read the line so that person then can react to me. Right. So that was the type of actor he was. He really mm. did want to treat them equally, no matter whether they were one line, two line, or or a co-star. You, you know, you hear about that, and um, it always it, when you hear about an actor being that generous, you know, because you're right, they don't have to be there in that scene because it's a close up of the other person. But it's much better if they can be there so they can really react and and not everybody does it obviously so it's really generous generous mm. of the actor when they do do that when they don't need to be on the set so I'd love to share something if I've got time you've got like is, a because I'm going to ask you in a second like where can people see this but go ahead real fast Tom. okay we have um in in the film the moment I think that in his career that engendered that that 
attitude to other actors is when he talks about Lionel Barrymore in The Bells, insisting the camera be on both of them so that they could see what Boris was doing. And I think that's a definitive moment in, in Karloff's life that really, you know, showed the respect that someone else felt to him and he reciprocated. So wonderful. Where can people find uh, Boris Karloff, the man behind the monster? Where can people watch it? They can find it in theatres um, from uh, the 17th of September. Uh, it's playing in theatres across the United States. Uh, there's a, a website that uh, I'm sure you can put a link up to that they can they can go to. And um, Ron, I believe in about a month's yeah, time. If, yeah, if you go to the website, that's the best. It's called themanbehindthemonster.com. And they're constantly updating it. it. It's also showing some wonderful reviews that we've gotten. It shows also all the locations where it's being played. And I think almost on a daily or weekly basis, they're updating that list to you know where more and more people can see it. And I'm sorry, Jan, where, where are you sitting again? You're in Hollywood? No, I'm in Carmel, California. Carmel. Okay. <laughs> yes. Because a friend of mine wanted to know in, in, in Hollywood, and this is what I love. It's playing at the in North Hollywood at a theater that's named after Carl Lemley. <laughs> yes, the Lemley. Amazing. Up to the, the Lemley Theater. Just amazing, the amazing. Of, so. Well, thank yes. you both. It's been wonderful. I, I, this is a great documentary. Everybody, this is a perfect time of year as we're going into yeah. the Halloween season. So it's a wonderful documentary. And I, I'm, you know, it's just, as I said, this time of year, they're going to be playing his movies a lot uh, everywhere. So thank yeah. you both. It's thank been a you. pleasure having you on the show. Take care. Thank Have you, a great Jan. day. Thank you. Right, bye -bye. Thank if, you. You're welcome. If you've missed any of the Jam Price shows all about movies, you can go to my website, thejampriceshow.com. You can also go on the iHeart Podcast Network, Apple, Google, anywhere where you get your favorite podcasts. Also go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Jam Price Show. Thank you all for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>